Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us this week. A uh, couple of announcements for some things coming up this week in the life of our church. Uh, the first is that this Thursday night, uh, July the 27th, is the next installment of the gathering event with City Dream Center. Uh, just a quick reminder, we're partnering with the Dream Center in hosting an outdoor uh, worship experience for the community uh, in North Surrey at Quantlin Park Secondary. Uh, it's testimony, it's message, it's worship, it's some stuff for the kids, it's a community meal. Uh, the invites are going out to the people who are often uh, fed through the hamper program or, th- or served through the back to school event. And this is the chance now to meet the spiritual needs of our community uh, and to really see what God might do if we set the table and the people come, uh, what might happen as they respond to the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So we want to encourage you to come join us for that night. It's 6 o'clock at Qualum Park Secondary. There's a variety of ways to be involved, whether you want to host and welcome people or be a part of the prayer team or man our church table or just be present and serve food uh, as part of the meal. Uh, Let me know if you're interested or email uh, City Dream Center to tell them that you're coming. Uh, And let's believe once again for God to do great things in our community as we put on the gathering event. Also this week is our summer VBS for our kids here at the church, Monday to Thursday. So we just want to take a moment. We want to pray for the kids that are coming. We want to pray for the volunteers and leaders that are serving them and really believe that God's going to do something incredible in the lives of our young people this week. So you join with me in praying for VBS. Uh, God, we thank you for the opportunity once again this week to host a bunch of kids in our church. Uh, and to facilitate them having fun and meeting one another and building friendships, but also to facilitate them worshiping you and to learning more about you. So God, we pray for every single kid that comes to the doors of our church this week. God, they would have an encounter with Jesus this week. That They would learn more about who he is and what he's done and his great love for each one of them. God, we pray that kids would make decisions for Jesus this week. We pray that kids would... Um, Uh, receive salvation, that they would be released in a variety of gifts and released in your Holy Spirit. Uh, God, we're just believing for a great encounter with our kids and you this week. And God, we thank you for the volunteers and the leaders from Hilltop and from our church who will be serving our children this week. God, I pray that you would give them energy. pray that you give them um, uh, patience and grace for the kids as it's going to be warm and kids will be excited and it'll be, uh, they'll be all over the place emotionally at times. God, we just pray for grace and for patience, for, for energy and for strength, for wisdom in answering questions and engaging conversations. And God, just pray that our leaders, our volunteers, uh, the adults and the students will be serving our kids this week would be blessed in loving on our kids this week and in seeing you move powerfully in their lives. God, we just thank you for VBS and just pray for a wonderful, wonderful week. In Jesus' name, amen. Now that's what's happening in the life of our church this week. Uh, it's now time for the message. Week three of You've Heard It Said. Hope you're ready. Hope you're excited. Church starts now. All right. Good day, church. Does anyone uh, remember the Choose Your Own Adventure children's book series from the 80s? Any fans out there? Anybody who still has a collection somewhere? It's a definite favorite of mine growing up, but it was also incredibly frustrating. Now, you may not know what we're talking about, so just to, to, to clue you in, if you're unfamiliar, the books, the Choose Your Own Adventure book series was designed so that the reader assumes the role of the protagonist and then makes choices which determine the actions of the characters and the outcome of the plot. So you might be reading along, the story would come to a fork in the road, and you'd see at the bottom of the page, do you want to go left, turn to page 35, or do you want to go right, turn to page 67? And depending on your choice in the matter, it would affect the outcome of where the story goes next. You know, it might even bring you to like a life and death situation where it says, do you fight off the alien invader, turn to page 102, or do you jump into the escape pod, turn to page 28? And these pauses in the story that would give you the reader choices would occur every few pages for maximum unpredictability in the, uh, the way the narrative unfolded. Depending on what choice you made, the story would either continue to progress or perhaps come to an abrupt end. There might even be multiple endings in each, in each book to you know, maximize the uh, desire to reread the book over and over again. But here's the thing. Maybe it was just me. Maybe it wasn't. But over time, I would tire of choosing the wrong adventure or, or, you know, or of arriving at the same ending over and over again. So I cheat. 
I'd look ahead. I'd, I'd predetermine the best choices to get to the best ending. I'd, I'd rig the outcome. I know I was like a terrible eight-year-old. I didn't want to choose my own adventure anymore. I wanted to control the adventure and make sure it worked out in my favor. I think this is often how we approach God's will for our lives in the reality of the here and now. We, we want God to tell us what pages to turn to for the best outcome. We want God to show us the big picture now, just reveal all parts of our life clear as day. We, we tire of not knowing how things will work out. Life is a series of choices, choices that lead to different outcomes. But what's the choice that God wants me to make? I think we all wrestle with that. So it's week three of You've Heard It Said, which is our summer series looking at commonly heard phrases both in the church or in culture that are, are either misquotes of Scripture or misattributed to Scripture. We're doing this because as followers of Jesus, it's so vital and important to know what the Bible says and what the Bible does not say. We can't allow bad theology to take root in our thinking because ultimately, bad theology, it harms the church and it harms our witness to the world. So this week, we're going to look at a phrase that attempts to define how God's will works, which is an incredibly important concept to unpack. What is God's will for my life is an incredibly commonly asked question. And versions of it exist outside of the church as well. We remove the word God from the statement, but we ask questions like, what am I meant to do? What's my, what's my destiny in life? So as we look at a false phrase, we're going to look at where that phrase falls short. We're going to look at what the Bible does say. We're going to look at how to answer this massive question of God's will that lies before us today. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll get into it. So God, we thank you for, the, for your word for the answers we can find in Scripture. God, we thank you that, that you are a God who loves us and is for us and has a plan for us, that you do have a will for each one of us. So God, I just pray for today that you would help us to more clearly understand this concept. Give us tools to better discern your will for our life. Help us to understand where our false statement will fall apart if we follow it too closely. And God, ultimately, I guess, help us to walk in step with where you're leading us. Help us to know your voice and help us to, to discern how best to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit in each one of our lives. We ask and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So you've heard it said. You've heard it said, when God closes a door, he opens a window. When God closes a door, he opens a window. Isn't that nice? What a lovely little sentiment. Or is it? Because what are we actually saying with that? When God closes the door, he opens a window. It's like saying, I know you really loved that job, and I'm so sorry you were laid off, but, but surely there's something better coming along. Or, you know, like, I know things have been really rough for you lately. You have so many closed doors, but there's an open window to climb through if you'll just find it. You know, how, how encouraging, right? Essentially, this saying states that if God says no to one opportunity— you can be sure that he's got another opportunity, probably a better opportunity, ready for you in the queue. And the subtext to this statement is that whatever God is saying no to in your life, whatever doors he's closing, you know, those probably weren't a part of his will for you anyways. We have to ask ourselves with this statement, is this what we believe? Is this, is this truly biblical? Now the short answer is no. And we'll take some time to cover the long answer as well. But the short answer is no. When God closes a door, he opens a window. Is not in the Bible. You cannot go to chapter and verse to find that. As a popular saying, its earliest version was actually found in the novel Don Quixote. And the phrase from that novel is, when one door is shut, another is opened. Now the saying is most commonly attributed to Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, who said, when one door closes, another opens. Which makes a lot of sense if your vocation, your calling, is one of invention and invention. Often you are looking for doors to close and doors to open to lead you to find the answer to what you're trying to invent or innovate. But you'll notice in both of those sayings, the word God isn't present. Because it, it appears as though what has happened is that these historical quotes about doors closing and doors opening have merged with biblical and religious cliche over the years to create this catchy saying designed to simplify God's will and impart truth regarding how we follow it, but ultimately failing to do so. 
So let's ask the question, is there any biblical basis for this saying? The answer to that is yes and no. The New Testament is full of open door imagery. It's a popular metaphor. Paul in particular seems to love using this phrase. Acts 14.27 1 Corinthians 16, 9, 2 Corinthians 2, 12, all those verses use open door language in regards to God creating opportunities for effective ministry. We hear, we see Paul write, a wide door for effective work has opened to me. We also know from a thorough reading of scripture that God is for us and he acts with our good specifically in mind. We do need to remember here though that he acts for our good in mind, not for our happiness in mind, and there is a difference. However, though there is biblical precedent for open doors and for God acting with our good in mind, however, and it's a big however, there's two things we have to keep in mind. Number one, the Bible shows us that every open door is not always good. There are plenty of individuals in the Bible who walked right through open doors of opportunity that were in fact bad choices, rife with consequences. God didn't slam doors shut to stop them from making a mistake. We see that time and time again in Scripture. So not every open door is always good. And the second thing we have to remember is every closed door isn't always bad. In Acts chapter 16, Luke writes that Paul and his companions were stopped by the Holy Spirit, not once, but twice from entering a certain area. To keep the metaphor going, God closed that door and made sure there was no window on the side. The Spirit stopped them from entering. We'd go, but why would God restrict ministry? This comes down to the idea that we have to trust in a God that is sovereign and a God that is in control. And that Sometimes when we find a door or a window or both closed shut, maybe it's for a reason that we're not meant to know in that moment. So the Bible shows us that every open door isn't always good and that every closed door isn't always bad. Now, moving along, moving along with that same thinking, what are the dangers of believing that when God closes a door, he opens a window? I've got five of them. Number one, the first danger of believing this, it promotes a false worldview that thinks life should be one favorable circumstance after another, or at the very least, that a favorable circumstance will immediately follow an unfavorable one. You know, if God closes a door, if he stops something from happening and I don't like it, you know, surely there's a window of opportunity, some sort of favorable outcome just around the corner. I hate to burst anyone's bubble today, but that's just not how life works. We're not promised unfavorable and then favorable, or just favorable, favorable, favorable. We're not promised that. That's not how life works. So believing this statement creates this false worldview that just isn't accurate. The second danger of believing that when God closes a door, he opens a window is this. It assumes that God's plans for us are the same as our plans for ourselves. There's a real possibility that some of our personal desires are not in keeping with God's plan for our lives. He closed the door for a reason, and he's not going to open a window. There's a very real possib- possibility that we can't, we can't just assume that, you know, God's plans for me are the same as my plans for me. So obviously, obviously he's going to keep opening and closing in line with what I want. That's just a false assumption of how God's will works, of his calling for your life, of his plans and purposes. Third danger of believing that when God opens a door, he closes, or when God closes a door, he opens a window, is this. It absolves us of doing any work ourselves. Believing this assumes that God will do all the work. He'll close the doors, he'll open the windows. We can just, we can just wait around while things are just opening and closing around us. But, But what if God's waiting on us to exercise some spirit-empowered wisdom and open some doors on our own? Or what if there's some opposition that needs to be cleared out of the way between where we are and the door that is open? Maybe some opposition that requires prayer and fasting in order to make the way clear? Is it possible that we have chosen to close doors that were open because we'd rather choose the path of least resistance? And along the same lines, the fourth danger of believing that when God closes the door, he opens a window is this. It promotes a faith that lacks discernment. Closed doors and open windows sound so simple. You know, what a wonderful, um, you know, paradigm to live by. It's going to look for doors and windows. 
But there's so much left to subjective interpretation with that statement. How do I know what's a door and what's a window? How do I know what's not a door and what's not a window? How do I, you know, what do I do if there's multiple doors and windows? How do I know that God is the one doing the opening and the closing? What if God closes the door but Satan opens the window? Decision-making and evaluating God's will requires wisdom and discernment. And reducing it all down to a simple cliche doesn't serve us or serve God well. And finally, the fifth danger in believing that when God closes the door, he opens a window is this. It removes our need to rely on the Holy Spirit for guidance. Metaphorical doors and windows are signs at best. And signs are great for comfort and they're great for confirmation. But guidance comes from the Lord. The Spirit leads us and directs us and guides us. And we are to rely on Him and Him alone and not just chase after signs. God calls us to align ourselves with his will as revealed in scripture to discern our context, our circumstance, and then to follow, to trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we know what God wants us to do? What does his word say about his will? Well, let's start with what I call God's will for all. Because contrary to popular belief, I don't see God's will as mysterious or hard to understand, or or difficult to see. In fact, there are plenty of places in the Bible where God just spells it out. He says, this is my will for humanity. So let's look at some specific verses and start piercing, piecing together what God's will is for you and for me. Turn, first of all, Old Testament, Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, 8. The prophet writes this. He has shown you, O mortal, which is a very fancy way of saying, he has shown you, humanity, mankind, man and woman, you and me, he has shown you what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. What does the Lord require of mankind? What is his will for us? There are three things there. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with him. In other words, his will for you and his will for me is that we would do what is right and what is fair, that we would treat others as we want to be treated ourselves, that we would not just show mercy, but that we would love showing it, that we would allow the mercy we have received from the Lord to radically transform how we respond to others, and that we would walk with God. And the beauty of that wording, walk with God, it's a picture of a close and intimate relationship in step with one another. And there's a qualifier for it, that we would walk with God in humility. There is no room for pride or arrogance within this relationship. It's a clear knowledge of you are God, I am me. I walk in humility with you, step by step. Turn with me now from old to new, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18. Paul writing to the church says this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So once again, what is God's will for you and for me? First, that I would rejoice always. There's always a reason to praise. Yes, life will have its ups and its downs. It'll have its mountains and its valleys, but God is constant God doesn't change, and for that alone, we have a reason to praise. For that alone, we can rejoice always. Secondly, that I would pray continually. Pray without ceasing, as some versions say. Pray, prayer is simply just it's communication with God. And we can choose to live every min, minute of the day in constant flowing dialogue with him. It doesn't mean that every couple minutes we just kneel down and fold our hands and bow our heads and start talking to God. It just means that we we keep the phone line open 24-7. That we're just in constant dialogue and conversation with the Lord, asking him to be a part of our every moment of our day, asking for his guidance, asking for his wisdom, praying continually. And the third thing we see here in Paul's words is that I would give thanks in all circumstances. And the wording is very clear. Not give thanks for all circumstances, but give thanks in all circumstances. 
we can have a grateful heart because our God is sovereign. We don't have to be grateful for everything that happens, but we can be grateful in everything that happens because our God is sovereign and he is in control. And then finally, go back a little bit to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Let's see what Jesus says about God's will for your life and mine in general. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus, as part of the Sermon on the Mount, says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what does Jesus say about God's will for us? Well, in the midst of a teaching about worry and about stress and about decision-making, what will I eat, what will I wear, what will tomorrow bring, what will I do with my life, Jesus gives the most simple answer possible. He says, seek first. Seek first. Make his kingdom and his righteousness your number one focus, your number one priority. And what does it say? All these things will be given to you as well. Not some, not part, but all these things. All these worries, all these decisions that we have, all these practical things we wrestle with. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things begin to fall into place. So a quick recap. What is God's general will for your life and mine? Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with him. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. And then seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's seven things that we can set our heart and our mind and our hands to to do every single day to ensure that we are walking in God's will for us. And then comes the million dollar question. How do these verses move us from understanding God's general will to what he wants me to do in my own life specifically? How do I discern God's specific will for my life? Which is usually the big question we're all asking. My firm conviction is this. Living out God's general will for your life, doing these seven things day in and day out, make discerning his specific will all the more doable. When you're already walking in his general will, his specific will becomes all the more clear. So let's talk about God's specific will. Let's talk about what he has planned for you and what he has planned for me. I have to be honest, there's a bit of a catch here. Because I can't really tell you <clears throat> what God's specific will for your life is. You know, maybe he'll give me that answer. But at this point, I don't, I don't have a list of everybody watching and what God's specific will is for each one of your lives. I don't, I don't have that answer. What I can do is provide insight on how best to discern his specific will for your life for yourself. I want to go to one more section of scripture for one final instruction to help us in this area. So please turn with me to Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It's Paul writing again. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And here, here's the part we want to highlight. Then, then once doing this, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, Paul lays it out so clearly. And I know we have to recognize that clear doesn't always mean easy. What he's asking of us is, um, is challenging. But Paul lays it out so clearly. He says, surrender, full and complete surrender, is the first step. Then pursue the things of God instead of the things of this world, which results in the renewing of our mind. That's what it says, is we pursue the things of God uh, rather than the things of this world. It renews our mind, which says all of that will result in the ability to test and approve. The word approve also means discern, to test and discern God's will. Or as the New Living Translation renders it, when you surrender your life to God, when you pursue the things of God instead of the things of this world, you will learn to know God's will for you. And I want to make a, I want to make a specific note here uh, to just bring more clarity. This section of Scripture, Romans 12, this is not adding to the seven items I outlined in God's general will. This is really a summation of them all. Because if you're doing those seven things, 
that, that, those are the action steps of a life surrendered to God. Those are the action steps of a life that's pursuing the things of God instead of the things of this world. So this is not like step 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. We're not adding to the seven. Those seven are, are an active part of this. This is just merely a summation of a life that's already doing those seven things. And the end result is the important piece. The end result of all of this is that you will learn to know God's will for your life. Any call that God has on your life starts with surrender. Starts with surrendering, the surrendering of our own plans, our own desires, our own goals, in order to walk in his plans and his desires and his goals. But here's what I've, what I've observed over the years, and it's probably one of the most important things um, in all of this. The one who created you, the one who instilled passion and gifting within you, his plans... Uh, will align with what's burning in, within you because he put those passions and desires there in the first place. The one who created the one who instilled these things within you, his plans will align with, with what's burning within you. Now, the caveat there is if what's burning within you is sinful desires or what's burning within you is like criminal desires, that's a different story. We're talking right now about someone who is actively looking to discern God's will for their life I'm saying that those things that are burning within you to do, to accomplish, those passions and desires, sometimes we have to lay them down and then pick them back up because God's asking us to. But his plans will most often align with what's already burning within you because he placed that desire and that passion there in the first place. Most likely his will is not some radical about face towards something you have no connection to or passion for. It's always the joke in youth group that like everyone's afraid that if they follow God's will, they're going to end up having to be a missionary overseas somewhere, like become a pastor, or, you know, go minister to the poor in some area of the world. And they're always like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm afraid of God's will. What if it's something really crazy and, and out there and like not something I don't want to do? Sometimes that happens. But so often his call for you is in alignment with all the things he's already put within your heart and mind to do. His calling is always a call to walk in the fullness of the person he created you to be. I, I read a blog post this week that put it like this. Calling, or God's will, is often the, often the trifecta of affinity, ability, and opportunity. In other words, do you like it? Can you do it? And has God made a way for it? So often we approach these big decisions in life. Should I, should I move to this city or that city? Should I take that job or this job? Should I enter into this relationship or not? We, enter, we, we approach these big decisions with this naivety of closed doors and open windows. Well, I guess God will just close a door and open a window if I'm meant to do this. When what God is really encouraging us to do in light of a life surrendered to him that walks consistently in his general will, is to just reevaluate these decisions based on affinity, ability, and opportunity. What am I passionate about? What am I gifted to do? What actual options lie before me? Now, last week, I, I referenced the book Garden City by John Mark Homer, and it's going to serve us well again this week as we expand on this thought. In fact, last week, I, I left us in a little bit of a cliffhanger going, you know, what does God want me to do for my life? What does he actually want me to do? And this is where we kind of pick up on that now. Uh, because in John Mark Comer's book, he, he talks a lot about vocation and calling. What are you supposed to do with your life? Uh, and these questions he lays out are great questions. They're, they lean towards that specific question, line of questioning. But I think a lot of what he's encouraging us to ask of ourselves is applicable in other areas of big decision as well. Uh, but before we hit these questions, I want to reinforce the main principle here. So often when it comes to God's will for our life, we want a clear answer. Or at the very least, we want clear options to choose from. We want, we want doors and windows that lead us in the right direction. But in reality, God's will is something that we discover. It's something that we unearth. It's a, it's a process that is realized through our relationship with Jesus, through our relationship with the Holy Spirit, and it requires us to put some effort into it. So I want to expand those three questions about um, affinity, ability, and opportunity. I want to expand those into eight questions that really help us to discern God's will and his calling in our lives. All right, so, so eight questions. First is this. What do you love? What do you love? Discover what drives you. Discover what you're passionate about. Ask yourself, can I, can I make a living doing this? What do I love? 
Second question is this, what am I good at and what am I bad at? What am I good at? What am I bad at? This talks about gifting, and this takes time to discover. And to be honest, it takes even more time to develop, but it's worth the time and the effort. In his book, Comer says, it's not failure if you fail at doing something you're not supposed to do. That ultimately is a success because you're one step closer to a clear sense of calling. You're, you're ruling out all the options of things you're not actually good at. And you're discovering, you're gifting what you actually are good at. Third question, what does your world need? What does your world need? Coma writes, we believe that fulfillment is found in giving our life away, not hanging on to it. So often the intersection of your passion and a felt need in the world around you is the epicenter of God's will for your life. It's the epicenter of your calling. What you're passionate about, what you're good at, when that intersects the felt need in your world, that right there, jackpot. Fourth question is this, does it make the world a more kingdom-like place? In other words, if I make this decision, if I, if I follow this path, does it please God? And does it align with his big picture plans, his big picture uh, purposes? And for that, um, that's a reference back to the original call in the garden that we looked at last week about creating culture and about uh, making something of this world that we've been dropped into. Uh, for more explanation on that, last week's video, but does it make the world a more kingdom-like place? Does it please God? Does it align with his big picture plans? Fifth question to ask ourselves, what are the open doors in my life? And I know we're trying to avoid the doors and the windows and the metaphors, but simply saying, what options are available? Where, where is God already making a way? Where are the clear paths? Sixth question is this, what is God blessing? It's a follow-up on the last one about what, you know, where is God making a way, but what is God blessing? In other words, what areas of your life are clearly heading up and to the right? Where is improvement and success just happening exponentially in your life? That might be a good indication of where God's hand of favor already rests and where he's gently leading you to walk into. Seventh question, what are people who know you well saying? Sometimes the people who love us and are close to us know us better than we know ourselves. So we need to listen to these people. When it comes to these big decisions in life, we need to ask them what they think and then really listen to what they think. And the eighth question is this. What is the Spirit stirring in your heart? This is similar to the first question of what do you love, where is your passion? But what is the Spirit stirring in your heart adds another layer of nuance. Because sometimes, and I'm not trying to contradict what I've already said today, but sometimes the Spirit stirs in our hearts things that we don't naturally love things we don't naturally have a passion for, or things that we have repressed over time for any number of reasons. And we need to be open to the idea that God is birthing, that he's stirring something new inside of us. And we need to pay attention to that. Understanding God's specific will for our lives doesn't usually involve sitting back and waiting or or looking for doors and windows. Understanding God's specific will for our life, discerning what he wants us to do, involves actively participating. It involves asking questions. It involves getting our hands dirty. And it involves learning to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, whenever I speak about God's will, I'm always reminded of a story that I read years ago in a book. It's the story of a young man coming out of seminary, trying to figure out God's will for his life and being paralyzed by indecision. So he approaches a friend of his who is also a pastor for some counsel and I just want to tell you that story because I feel it really brings all into clear perspective. So like I said, this is a young man. He's on his way to seminary. He's um, incredibly gifted in a variety of ways. Unfairly gifted, as the author wrote. And there are so many opportunities before him. There are, there are pastorates. There are ministry staff positions. There are so many um, requests for him to go do this and go do that. He had a ton of options before him. And he wasn't just like a casual believer. This is someone who is deeply committed Uh, to Jesus, a deeply committed follower of Christ. He wasn't having to choose between good options and evil options or good options and bad options. His his personal dilemma was there are so many good options. He was he was paralyzed with the uh, with the with the question of of all these good options, what is God's will for my life? What is the one option he wants me to take? And his greatest personal concern was somehow not choosing God's will for his life, or, or making the, the, the one choice that went against God's will for his life. So he waited, he waited with earnestness for God to speak to him. 
you know, like I said off the top, in some sort of clear, undeniable way. Here is how the story goes. Here is your entire life laid out before you. Here's all the choices to make. But nothing in that nature was coming. Uh, and for some reason, this individual, this, this young man, did not feel like he had permission to choose. So he chose to not choose anything. And in doing so, he essentially chose to do nothing. And the pastor goes on to say that he, he gave him very simple advice in regards to this indecision, to this, this paralyzing, what do I do with my life question. The pastor whose counsel he had inquired simply said, hey, just do something. Just do something. The young man was shocked at what he saw as a, just a callous disregard for the sovereignty of God and for the will of God in his life. His response to the pastor is, I have, I have too much respect for the sovereignty of God to just do something, to just make some sort of choice. And the pastor responded, he said, do you think that, that Hitler or Stalin or anybody along that nature was capable of, of thwarting the sovereignty of God? And the student's response was, of course not. And the pastor pointed out that if, if men and women throughout history who gave their lives for a purpose counter to the will of God, could not, with their actions, stop God's purposes in history. How could someone who loves Jesus so deeply, who longs to do God's will, somehow manage to choose something out of line with God's character? The pastor responded to the student, I have too much respect for the sovereignty of God to think that you or I could mess it up. I think sometimes... At the end of the day, after all the analyzing, after all the question asking, after all the weighing of options, we just need to do something and trust that God is already preparing our steps forward. That if we are in love with Jesus and earnestly seeking his will for our life and desperately desiring to please him and to, to do something that, that matters and that affects his kingdom and that loves people, if all those, thing, all those boxes are checked, it is almost insulting to tell God that, you know, I, I, might, I might make the wrong choice. I might, I might screw up all of your plans for the world. Sometimes we just need to do something. Take the next right step. Take the next step that's available to us and just believe that God's already preparing and ordaining our steps forward. So as we come to a close today, you have heard it said, when God closes a door, he opens a window. But the word of God encourages us differently. The word of God says, align your life with his will which is clearly revealed in the word, and trust in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Your life and mine is not some wild choose-your-own-adventure novel. Even though we some, sometimes may treat it as such, your life and mine is not some wild choose-your-own-adventure novel. God loves you. He is for you. He has a plan for your life. You have a calling, and you are a part of his will for this world. But that doesn't mean that he's going to reveal the ending or show you the best choices to make all at one time. He wants to build a relationship with you. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to learn how to hear his voice. He wants you to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and he's given us the tools to do so. Whether it's verses that speak to his general will, or, or action steps to discern his specific will, he has made a way for us to walk in his will. You know, we're not, we're not animals in a maze being led by doors and windows that open and close. We are human beings designed and called by our creator. So let's commit ourselves to doing his general will on a daily basis. Let's commit ourselves to asking good questions when it comes to big decisions. Let's learn to trust in the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Because at the end of the day, being led by the Spirit of God is far better than chasing after doors and windows, be they open or closed. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your great love for us, for your great care for us. God, we thank you that you are very much for us. And God, we thank you that your will is not a mystery, that you lay out so clearly in Scripture your will for mankind, your desire for each one of us that we would act justly, that we would love mercy, that we would walk humbly with our God, that we would rejoice always and pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. God, I pray for those watching today who are struggling with this concept of God's will. God, I pray that they would 
begin to just implement these seven things into their life. They begin to walk day in and day out in God's general will for them. And God, I pray that, that they would find so quickly that your specific will, your calling for their life, just comes into focus. It just comes into clarity when we commit ourselves to just walking day in and day out in your general will for mankind. And God, I pray for those who are earnestly asking the question, God, what do you want me to do with my life? God, I pray that you'd reveal it to them. I pray that you would help them to see your specific will for their life. I pray that they would begin to ask themselves pointed questions and do some self-evaluation and begin to realize the giftings you've given them, the passions you've given them, the, the desires you've given them, and how those begin to align with the walking out of your specific will in their lives. God, I pray they would not be afraid of your will. I pray they would not rank certain things as higher or lower, or as more desirable or less desirable. They would recognize that you have instilled within them so much passion and gifting that aligns with what you are calling them to do. Help them to see that clearly. And God, I pray that we would not fall victim to simple cliches about closing doors and opening windows when understanding your sovereignty and your providence and your will for us and your calling for our lives is so much greater than just doors and windows. There's so much more nuance. There's so much to be built between us in relationship and in trust as we follow after what you have for us. So I just pray that we would just come into a, a fuller understanding, a healthy understanding of your will for each one of us and that we would put in the work to follow after what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're watching today and you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. It's as simple as just praying this prayer along with me. So if you're watching and you want to know Jesus, you want him to be a, 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 a personal, you want to have a personal relationship with him in your life, you just pray this along with me. Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. That you rose again from the grave victorious. Jesus, I ask right now that you would come into my life. That I would experience your love, your grace, your peace, your mercy, your forgiveness. God, that you would clearly show me the next steps to take and how to, to walk in alignment with your will and your commands and in alignment with your ways. I leave behind my old self and I step into the, the person you've called me to be. Jesus, I, I choose you today. Amen. If that was you, we want to celebrate that decision with you. Let us know. Contact our church office. Contact one of our pastors. We want to celebrate that decision. We want to put a Bible into your hands. We want to make sure that you um, know how to connect to our community or to another community of faith and really be involved in, in what the church is doing. Uh, as always, we love you. We care for you. If you have any praise uh, reports or prayer requests, please let us know. We uh, want to make sure that we're praying for you and celebrating along with you. Uh, have a wonderful week, and God bless. We will see you soon.